I typed in my phone, three good tires and a spare. Sitting on the side of the interstate, trying to figure out, you know, if I'm going to change this tire right before dark. But when I got home from that fishing trip with my dad, I, I was I was writing one night, sitting around, and that idea, but I just started kind of humming that damn these Biloxi Blues line. And I, and I just kind of, I, I truly, loosely based it on dad, always trying to get out of Mississippi. Hey, y'all. We're switching gears here a little this week on the Fishing Business Podcast. Usually, I try to introduce you to people at fishing brands or businesses who can help you understand the business better. And a lot of times, those people are marketers or business managers or something like that. Well, this week, our guest is actually another podcast host. Only his podcast has a much bigger audience than mine, and he has a huge following because he is highly, highly, highly entertaining. The guest this week is Luke Duncan, whose podcast is called Low Budget Live. If you've never seen this before, you're in for a treat. It's really a, it's really a great podcast. He follows the sport of fishing and the competition, and it's kind of a topical. Every week, he talks about what's going on in the sport. I thought it would be good for you to meet Luke. So he can tell you a little bit more about what makes a good podcast guest. Because when you get invited to be on a podcast, and you will be invited to be on a podcast one day, you're going to want to know how to be the very best you can be. So listen to Luke's advice this week, y'all. It really applies to a lot of different things besides just being on a podcast. Um, if you've been invited to be, in, be interviewed by your local newspaper or even when you're on the weigh-in stage, this advice can go a long way for all of those things where you need to speak publicly. All right, here we go, y'all. This is going to be good. Hey, Luke Duncan, I'm so glad to finally get to sort of talk to you face-to-face. We've emailed a lot. I mean, from years back, we've emailed. Years back. Through. You're a good friend of Gerald Swindles. Gerald's a good friend of mine. And I think back then you were really more involved in the music scene and we were trying to get some things going with you doing some music, right? Yeah, so uh, trying to play some music at some bass events for uh, Mountain Dew or somebody back yep. in the day. It was That was a Gerald connection there for sure. He, he's a master at putting all those kind of things, <laughs> connecting the dots <laughs> between is. people. He really is. But, he is. And, and listen, it's interesting because I've interviewed a lot of people that are industry, fishing industry professionals that had an interesting way they came into the sport, an interesting background, but yours may take the cake. I don't, I've never met anybody who's, who came in through the music door. Well, and and you know, it's my story's kind of strange in that I was doing music while I was in the industry too. So I worked for TH Marine while I was chasing that deal. Uh, I actually had a songwriting and publishing deal. So I was I was getting paid to write for a company out of Muscle Shoals, Alabama for a while and playing bars and festivals and that whole thing. But my whole life, since since really I was like ten or twelve, music and fishing have always been my two loves. I mean, my entire life. And, and my dad did both. So really? he, kinda, you know, he did. He, he played in bands in high school and college and things and, and wrote music and he was a bass player. And so I've always, and my dad used to joke with people, he said, oh, he'll either be a, a country singer or a pro fisherman. I mean, like <laughs> that, that was just kind of always the joke around our, our house because I, that's the only two focuses I've really ever had. Yeah. you know, or, or those two things. I started writing songs at a really early age and then started fishing tournaments when I was about 12. So it was like, they always just kind of stuck with me. Well, let me tell you something. If you can figure out how to live your life working in the music industry and in the fishing industry, dude, you got it figured out. That's a... Well, I, I, there have been some long days where I think maybe this is crazy, but I, I tell you what, it's not work. That's the old saying, it's not work if you love what you do. And I've been very fortunate. I'm 15 years now working in the marine industry, bass fishing industry, and I, I've been able to, you know, carve my little corner out in this in this crazy bass fishing world. And, then I, and I've, you know, carved out uh, more recently, it's funny, my music now is resonating with people more than it did when I was playing music. It's it's really wild through the podcast and things. So it's it's really exciting for I'm actually writing more now than I did oh, back that's then. Great. Gonna, yeah, I'm gonna try that's to release great. some new music uh hopefully later this fall. I've got some stuff that uh 
got to get recorded, but oh, I'm so glad to hear that. So tell yeah. me, what is the story? Biloxi Blues is your is your theme song, right? Yeah, and yeah, I so, love that song. I just yeah. love it. But what's the was, what's the story on that? So that was always always one of Gerald's favorite songs, which is kind of funny. But uh, that song. All my stories, a lot of they story songs are always my passion, but they're not really autobiographical by any ways. I, I, a lot of the writers I listen to, they kind of tell a story from you know from another perspective. But that story was loosely based. I, I truly, I was I was constantly in a notepad in my phone or something. Go down the road, see something on a billboard, think of something, write it down, or be having a phone conversation with somebody and they say a line, and you're like, ah, okay, thank you. You know, and then you write an entire story off that. I've always been, you know, like that in, in mm-hmm. creative writing kind of um, setups. So my dad, my entire life has worked in Mississippi. We live in Southern Tennessee and it's about an hour and 40 minutes away, but he's been back and forth my entire life. And Every time he would take me down there, I, and this is no offense to the state of Mississippi at all, but he, I, I didn't like it. I never liked it as a kid, but then, but Mississippi took my dad away. That was always kind of like, uh. you know, and he was always doing whatever he had to do to get back to us, you know, at the end mm-hmm. of the week and, oh. and what have you. And so that song kind of based that, that Biloxi, which he's North Mississippi, but that idea kind of sprang from that. But, but I'll be honest with you, I had a blowout on the side of I-65 going to meet him in Gulf Shores, Alabama, for a fishing trip. Oh, wow. And I typed in my phone, three good tires and a spare. Sitting on the side of the interstate, trying to figure out, you know, if I'm going to change this tire right before dark. But when I got home from that fishing trip with my dad, I, I was I was writing one night, sitting around, and that idea, but I just started kind of humming that damn these Biloxi Blues line. And I, and I just kind of, I, I truly... Loosely based it on dad, always trying to get out of Mississippi, you know, always trying to get back home to us. The three good tires and a spare line just fell into place. Yeah. And, and, and truly, I don't know a lot about the state of Mississippi. So Google helped me write that somewhere than ah. anything because I was working like, you know, I know the city, like I was basically like Tupelo and, it, and it's got a lot of, mm-hmm. um, you know, talking about Civil War ghosts. It's got a lot of Mississippi history in that song, but uh, loosely yeah. based about my dad. And the coolest thing for me musically that I'll, that I'll ever, to my dying day, I don't think I'll ever get to do anything in music cooler than this. I got to play the Bluebird Cafe in Nashville, um, probably oh, wow. 2000, about 2012, and with a, wow. a songwriter hero of mine named Walt Aldridge. He wrote uh, "Holding Her, Loving You," uh, oh. Earl Thomas Conlon. He wrote "Modern Day Bonnie and Clyde Travis Tree." He, he wrote a lot of big songs, and and he's one of my favorite writers. But he invited me to play at the Bluebird and I got to Man. play Biloxi Blues in front of my dad at the Bluebird. Oh. And that and that that video is actually on YouTube somewhere, but but that's one of the one of my I mean and all my songwriting heroes, the Bluebird is a hallowed place in Nashville. And I was going to say, I under, yeah. I, under, I know the Bluebird, but explain to people listening what that the, really means what, when you play at the Bluebird. And, and when you drive by the Bluebird, it's like, oh, what's that? You know, it's just in a little strip mall, but it is a place that that you have to be invited to play. They do an open mic night, but you have to be invited to play, but it's a, it's a place strictly for songwriters. So they'll get, they're famous for in the round and you have four songwriters kind of sit in a circle and you do a song swap. And I grew up, you know, listening to CDs that were made during things where guys tell stories of songs have always just, I've loved them. And so you, it's your turn. Hey, Luke's up next. It comes to you and you tell, Hey, I'm going to play this song. You tell a story about it. But their thing is on all their t-shirts, they have shh because Mm -hmm. You can hear a pin drop. Everybody listens to every word. And it's such a, for a songwriter, it's such a, a great experience because everybody listens to everything you say. And when you're playing a, a, a rowdy bar or a festival, you're like, hey, I wrote this song about my dad. You may have three people listen to you out of 500, but they're ready yeah. to hear Sweet Home Alabama, right? <laughs> but but at, at, at the Bluebird, it's just, but everybody, if you can think of them, if you've listened to them, from hit songwriters to stars, from James Taylor, Garth Brooks, I mean, you name them, they've played there. And it, it's just, it, for me, it'll always just be that that deal. Short of, if I could ever play the rhyming, that would oh, be, yeah. obviously. But the Bluebird for a songwriter, that's just that's just it for yep, me. It is. There's so much respect and honor there for the songwriting process and all the words oh, yeah. of that. Um, so, Low Budget Live is your podcast. Yes, ma'am. Traveling Circus is your YouTube channel? Yeah, is that so right? it, it, it is. And the Traveling Circus, so 
the name for that came from the fact that my life is that pretty much all the time. I have my wife and I, we're like the Brady Bunch. We're a blended, we're a blended family. We, we joke about that all the time. It is a circus. My wife says that because I've got one playing soccer over here, one playing baseball. My daughter's at college, blah, blah, blah. We're just crazy all the time. I'm on the road. My wife teaches at a college. So just lots of moving parts. So that's kind of where the name for that came from. And I, I took a cameraman with me my last year on the FLW tour to kind of document. I want. I felt like Brandon Pollock did an excellent job yeah. on the Elite Series. Him and Kyle, they have a great series. And I, I took from that and I talked to Brandon about it. Said, hey, I want to do that. And, and my fishing career was very different than Brandon's and that I didn't <laughs> catch him like Brandon does. Yeah. But I wanted to show like there are other sides to this because I feel like so many young anglers sometimes don't realize the struggles sure they see the shiny trophies and the jerseys and the boat wraps yeah. and they don't realize there's a lot more that goes into it so i wanted to showcase the good the bad and the ugly so that's kind of where the traveling circus began and now it's just a hub that's where all my youtube stuff goes and yeah. and uh and I like it's it. probably it's probably confusing for some people i guess you know because i do the podcast there but and the podcast is probably the most popular thing I do on the channel, but it's still the circus is always just oh, kind of yeah. where it all comes together. I think it you know? gives you a great opportunity to be real flexible about, you know, the content Absolutely. that you do. And Absolutely. And push out and not, I think Absolutely. I think that's really, um, that's really good. And, you know, I do want to say though, before we move on, um, I love that you say the good, the bad and the ugly, because sometimes I think anglers, pro anglers, uh, dwell too much on the we need to show these young guys how hard it is um because yeah. it is hard i mean there's no doubt so about hard. it it's so hard. hard it's but, hard but it's also really rewarding and really fun and it you is. get another family we, we're all in, we were all Absolutely. in that traveling circus and we all have, were family you know yeah we, and, pack, um, we pack it up and move it on to the next town I'll, i always used to joke it's smoke and mirrors it's here and then yeah. it's gone to the next place and it's a lot like a, a bunch of carnies yeah. Oh, oh absolutely. The, mean, no, there's no doubt. We are. We're, th we're there for each other on the road. You're mm -hmm. grilling out on the side of the lake somewhere. I mean, you, you may yeah. do when you're away from your family. And I wanted to showcase all of that for yeah. sure. I yeah. love that you did. So that's a good segue, Luke, to what, where are you at with professional fishing right now? So I, I, I love it. I'll always hold it near and dear to my heart and I would like to do it again one day. But for me, timing wise, with a lot of things going on in life and then in the professional fishing world, uh, 2020 was a year that, that I felt like I needed to step away. I made that yeah. decision in the fall uh, of 2019. And, you know, I, I've made no buts about it. I've talked about it a lot on my podcast, but I didn't like the direction everything was headed with FLW with new ownership and things. And I've talked that into the ground. but. Uh, Actually, next year I was looking at fishing the Bassmaster Opens, but but this new this new opportunity has landed in my life in the last few weeks for the National Professional Fishing League. Uh, I'm going to be doing a commentary thing there, a live uh, do, being their low budget Mark Zona, as I've been calling myself. <laughs> but uh, uh, but so silly. so I don't know. Depending on schedules and all that, if I'll get to fish and do that, it's just you know. Uh, I'm going to owe my wife a lot of jewelry anyways. Oh, yeah. So and Maybe some purses. <laughs> probably so. <laughs> probably so. So I, I don't know. You know, for me, I, I hope that it always gets back to that. I love talking about the sport. I love representing the sport in every way I can. If, and if that becomes, hey, you're just going to be a media person, I, I don't see myself having a problem with that. You know, because yeah. I get to fish through the traveling circus. I get to, I get to educate. I get to promote. For the mm -hmm. people that support me, um, and I get to go fishing, I get, to, get film to be on the water too. So, and, and for me, tournament fishing at the professional level is so stressful. Even though it is fun, it's so stressful. And this year, which has been a hard reset for everybody, I feel like right. Yeah. Twenty twenty has kind of gotten us back to the basics. But for me, this year, and I've always said and tried to preach, you know, fishing is fun, regardless of what you're doing in fishing, whether it's making a million dollars or you know just a guy that, that just wants to go crappie fishing on a Saturday, the root of fishing while we all got into it is, is because it's fun. So for me, 2020 has been about getting back to that. I've been fishing with my kids a ton, fishing the lakes I grew up on. And so for me right now, it's just kind of wherever the wind blows me with yeah, professional I fishing. Yeah, I, I, I love the sport. And, and you do realize a lot of things like doing a podcast, and I'm sure you, you realize this more and more. I interview these guys that 
that that are dominant that that really you know have had so much you know so many their careers took different paths than mine did and you get to hear them breaking things down and I consider myself a, a very good fisherman I'm like I would have never thought about that like <laughs> those, those things you're like you, you, you interview a Chris Saldane and a Brandon Politic or recently I had Buddy Gross on and I called one of my best friends Darian after I got off the the podcast and I said Buddy we're, we're out of our league with some <laughs> of these guys because Buddy Gross breaking down the types of leaves on brush piles that he sees on his electronic that, when he won you fall it's just that kind yeah. of stuff is I know how to find the brush piles. I know how to see the fish in the brush. When he's breaking them down, well, they were on this kind of tree better than this one. I'm like, hey, you know what? No wonder yeah. that guy took my money for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I okay. Saying, I never, you know, that's something I think being being uh, controversial at times on the podcast or speaking my mind, I get a lot of I get a lot of insults hur- hurled my way. People are like, oh, you couldn't make it with a rod and reel, so you have to pick yeah. things apart now. And for me, look. I never said I was Kevin Van Damme. Yeah. That was never my thing. I had an opportunity to do it. I always wanted to do it. And I want to do it again someday. But I never I never lived up to my expectations for it. And other than that, I'm not really worried about, you know, what the what the next guy thought. You know, right. I was fortunate that I had companies that stuck with me and my and my family stuck with me through it. But we'll see. We'll yeah. see. Professional fishing's crazy right now. You know it that. Is, it's, man. It's a it's the wild west right now. It so is I, the I, wild don't, west. I don't know what's gonna happen. It's so. gonna be we'll so see. much fun to watch. And listen, I want to talk to you more about your new gig. I'm gonna take a Absolutely. quick quick break right here, and then we'll come right back with Luke Duncan on the Fishing Business Podcast. Do you know what your personal brand is? Because everyone has a personal brand. You may not be intentional about it yet, but all that you say or do or write or post contributes to how others perceive you. And that, my friends, is your personal brand. If you want to develop your brand and mean the things you want it to mean, I have a workbook that will help you get started, and it's free. You can download my Developing Your Personal Brand Workbook at www.fishingbusinessschool.com slash brand workbook. All right, we're back on the Fishing Business Podcast with Luke Duncan, the host of Low Budget Live, a podcast, Low Budget Live, and also an extremely entertaining YouTube channel called The Traveling Circus. You can really, you can just Google Luke Duncan Low Budget Live and all of that will come back to you. You're, you, you can, you're easily findable, which is really, really important for what you do. But tell me, we started talking about this before the break. Tell me about your new gig. So my new gig is uh, there's a new tournament trail starting and and it's you know um, pretty pretty bare bones fishing uh, that's that's what I like to say it's it's going to be called the National Professional Fishing League these guys are are seeking out to just kind of fit in um, a little different niche and the, they're not trying to be the elite series they're not trying to be major league fishing but there are a lot of people and I think you would agree from from coming from that that world you lived it for a very long time that. We have so many people, these college kids, mm-hmm. high school kids coming up. Uh, maybe it, there, there are guys that can't commit their entire life to fishing the elite series, right. but they want to fish for high stakes, big money. So that's kind of where the National Professional Fishing League is going to fall. And they're going to be about five weeks in between tournaments. So you really, you could have a day job technically still fish a professional level tournament, but their, their biggest thing is they're going to offer professional level coverages and that's their goal. And so they're going to have live streaming at every event. And for some reason, they decided that I needed to be the host of that. Oh, you'll be uh, fantastic. You will I'm be really, fantastic. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I had the pleasure of, of working with uh, uh, Bass Live a couple times on location with Mercer okay. when they were down here at Wheeler and, and doing a few spots like that. And then I worked with FLW Live uh, commentating a few events that I wasn't competing in and Really loved that. I've, yeah. I've talked to guys like Mark Zona and Ronnie Moore about it at length, you know. And yeah. when this opportunity popped up, I thought, you know, that's something I really think that I would I would really enjoy. So hopefully it's going to be – their coverage is going to be really interactive. They're trying something different in that they're going to have a live chat. Oh. During the broadcast, going to be a little different. And and it's really not going to be made for TV. So it's going to be made, made more for YouTube and, and that immediate consumption of the streaming. So – You'll be able to get on there and say, yeah, you're crazy. Shut your mouth, Luke Duncan. So uh, well, I'm going to be in the peanut time. gallery. Yes. Okay, yeah, I will be. be. Uh, and you know, like I know, there are a lot of armchair quarterbacks. In oh, fishing. yeah. That's so right. it should be very interesting to see what we come up with. But, yeah, I'm real proud. It's Look, those guys make no, uh, no buts about the fact that they got an uphill battle 
trying to do something new and fishing is, is not easy, uh, especially in a COVID world that we're living. We don't even know what 2021 is going to bring as far as being able to have attendance at events and blah, blah, blah. But I'm really looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing where that goes. And couldn't be happier that they picked me. I'm very proud ex- to be a part of it. It'll be a great experience for you. What, no matter how it ends up, it'll be a great experience Absolutely. for you. I'm really happy for you that you get to do Thank that. Thank you. But help. Does your podcast and this opportunity, how does that, we haven't talked about your day job. So you also <laughs> work at TA Marine. <laughs> and it, are you, you're full time, right? Yeah, I have been for, for 15 years there. I'm, I'm a regional sales manager. Uh, I basically, I sell to OEM boat builders. So, if you get a boat from Skeeter, Ranger, uh, Tracker, Phoenix, uh, G3, to name Express Boats, to name a few, I'm the one that sells them their TH parts. So oh. that's that's what I've done for, for years and years and years and going to continue to do it as, as long as they'll have me. But I, they've been very, uh, very good with me while I was fishing the tour. They supported that, so actually sponsored me outside of work oh, to, great. you know, to give me the opportunity to do that. But those guys, it's really cool working with a company that's been in the industry for 40 years like that. I've been able to gain a lot of, of experience and a lot of my relationships that I built that turned into sponsorships down the road were actually relationships I forged by being at a Bassmaster Classic working for TH Marine. And you meet yes. somebody at a restaurant or a friend of a friend kind of thing. Right. So I was very fortunate in that. And, and so I do that along with the podcast and, and you got to fit it in when you can, I guess, but, right. but I'll make it work. And, and somebody said, well, are you quitting TH Marine when the MPFL thing popped up? I got a comment on YouTube. Are you quitting TH Marine? Are you going to not do the podcast anymore? I said, no, actually it'll be about my fourth job. So uh, <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. I've got well, a lot of energy. Great. So that's great. Well, okay. So how has your, um, your sales role, um, influenced your ability to market yourself and your podcast and, and, and as a pro angler and everything? Well, I think that, you know, not just the sales role, but being, working in the industry and seeing kind of behind the curtain as far as on a marketing perspective, seeing what, you know, proposals people send in, yeah. how they represent themselves, how a company reacts to those proposals. That was very, very crucial for me from, you know, they hired me right out of college. I was a marketing grad and fished the Bassmaster Opens, and I met them while I was fishing the Open. So they hired a 22-year-old, big-eyed, wanting to be a pro fisherman and throw me into the fire, so to speak. And so, and I thought pro fishing is life. And as long as you say, yeah, I fish the Bassmasters, that people are going to get out their checkbook, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's what you think, I guess, when you're young and naive. But Learn, that really helped me learn because I went several years after I started at TH when I was really building the foundation of my career. I didn't fish at the professional level. I mean, there were probably six, seven years that went by that I didn't even, I didn't even think I was fishing a lot of team tournaments mm-hmm. but and playing music during that time. But I really, it was, it was like 2013 when I kind of got that, that hunger to, to try that again. Um, and they gave me the opportunity to do that. But, um, but I learned so much because I think the, the number one thing people don't realize is these companies, whether it be, you know, a boat company, motor company, electronics, lures, hundreds of people reach out to them. And more so now, I think, because of social media, through social media, direct yeah. messages and things, they get bombarded yes. with requests. So it's figuring out how to separate yourself, you know, especially if you're an up and coming guy, you've got to figure out how to get their attention. You know, what about you separate yourself? Because obviously they know that Gerald Swindle is catching them because they see him on ESPN too. They don't know you as you're up and coming. So I think it taught me a lot, a lot in that and a lot just how to handle yourself. You know, if you're an ICAST, don't go up and interrupt somebody that appears to be having a meeting to give them a resume. (laughs) You you see a lot of people do things like that. And you're like, Hey man, I I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't take that approach. And, and I hope that, Every young angler that reaches out to me, Instagram, Facebook, I try to, you know, teach them those things because I feel like it's there's too much, too much of the time they just think you can just go, you know, bull in a china shop. Right. And and our joke, one of my best friends at TH Marine, Corey Williams, we joke about this all the time. He says, I fish real good. Can I get something for free? Because <laughs> there are so many people that are like, I love your product. Can you give me some of it? And they're yeah. like, wait a second. You wouldn't call Sony televisions and say, hey. Right. Your man, your 4K TV is made. Can I get one for free? Right. I mean, it's just 
but the fishing industry really, I mean, it kind of people oh. think it works that way. So yes. that that's my biggest thing that I learned is just how to conduct myself. And I won't say that I'm a have a master's degree in it at all because I still I found myself, especially with the podcast, it's very odd trying to sell myself to sponsors. I, I don't know why, but it, I, I get nervous yeah. in those situations. And in sales situations, normally I don't. I don't care if it's the janitor or the CEO of the biggest company. I normally, I treat everybody the same. I expect to be treated the same. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's just always kind of been how I was raised. But sometimes when you're selling yourself, you feel a little narcissistic, right? Like if you're like, well, this is, this is why you need to low budget life. So it gets, it gets hard for me in those situations. So I'm definitely not, I'm still learning Mm -hmm. as I go. And the podcast is different than trying to sell yourself as an angler. Right. With a boat and truck wrap and jerseys yeah. and things, it's, it's a little bit different. So I'm it's still, hard. Uh, it's hard to go out there with, I'm so great. Look at how great I am. You it, know? it is. And, and for me, the biggest put off, because I handled marketing for TH for a couple of years there, that was my biggest thing. If you came in guns blazing like that, mm-hmm. if you've got to ring your own bell that much, yeah, most likely you don't have anything to back it up with. You know, you're right. like, Kevin Van Dam doesn't call you and tell you he's the best. You already know that. That's right. right. So that's right. And that, so so that was that's my thing with that. You're much more you're much more likely to get somebody's attention if you call up with, "Hey, I've got an idea that I might be able to help you." That that's the key is what can you do to help the company you're mm-hmm. trying to get on with? It's not how many crankbaits are you going to send me? You know, yeah, right. You exactly. pay me. They don't want to hear that. They can yeah. do that for literally. Take a name out of a hat, pick an angler, and give them everything they want, right? Mm-hmm. You've got you to approach it from a what you can do for them standpoint, for sure. Okay, so what about getting on a podcast? How, do you, how does somebody increase their chances of getting to be a guest on a podcast? Okay, so I, this is one, you opened up a can of worms with me on this Uh-oh, one. Uh-oh, here we go, I'm y'all. Here we go. I'm, a very, I'm very opinionated on this, and, and this is, uh, and I, I'll say this. Um, and I don't mean this to sound arrogant or anything. I just think like it's kind of the same way if, and and look, there are a lot of guests I don't know about it. And and I have people, Hey, suggest get so-and-so on, or I see Mm -hmm. the YouTube comments that because it it may be a story I'm not aware of. I do really try to keep up with the the fishing world in relation to my podcast Yeah, because I, I talk about topical things, but for me, the worst thing in the world to do is to direct message Somebody with a Facebook message, direct message, or get their number. Hey, man, I want to come on your podcast. That is the worst (laughs) thing to do in the world. Because most of the time, I'm like you in that I have an idea of what guests I want. Yeah. And and look, I've got buddies that say, hey, I want to come on your show to talk about this. That's something going on. That's a different situation. I'm saying when you, hey, man, you need to have me on your podcast. Well, Why? Yeah. You know, if it's just some random, and I get those, I get a lot of that on Instagram and that would, that would be something I'd tell people just, you know, I'm out there, I'm connected in the industry to the media side. I follow a lot of stuff on social. I do a lot of homework. Hey, I want to have that on. That's a topical thing. Hey, this guy just won this tournament and I keep up from weekend level, like BFL stuff. Like I, I do just, I, mm-hmm. I try to keep up with what's going on. And, and I try, and, and I want, I don't want to say that I can pick you because I can't, I have people turn me down for the podcast all the time. Um, but, but I can have a guest every week, right. Yeah. And just like you can, but so be careful that kind of, that comes off a little, uh, you got to play hard to get right. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little right. pushy with that. So that, that's my biggest thing is for me, it's kind of what's going on. Cause my yeah. podcast is very, it's, I, I record it, Normally on a Sunday to post on a Monday. So it's very topical. What happened that week? I talk about my life. Yeah. What's going on in my life and then the fishing industry or the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's plenty to talk about with all that. We, we all know that. But so I normally I've got an idea who I want to have on every week. So would it be uh, safe to say then that if someone did try to reach out to you to be on your show, that they ought to have a good idea to pitch on why or hey i've got this this charity i'm working with or i've got you know or have uh somebody they work with reach out that because a lot of people have people that represent them things Mm -hmm. like that publicists and things but just to go hey i'm fishing this can i come on your podcast right that's right that's that's not very professional and and that's the same as reaching out to a sponsor going hey you should give me money so totally so I do, I, I won't say I take offense to it because I appreciate anybody that wants to be on the podcast. Mm-hmm. But 
you got to handle it the right way, you know, right. I, I feel like. And yeah, because, I agree. Because I've never, I'll say this, I've never, I've never turned many folks down to be on one, but I've also never called one and said, hey, you need to have me on. I mean, I've never called the guys that I climb and said, hey, you guys need to have me on because I'm yeah. doing this. Now they've called me a few times and that's great. Yeah. So you got to, you got to be careful with that because you can, it's like I said, with people coming in guns blazing from the sponsor thing, I never, it took me a while on some of them, some of them won me over over time, mm-hmm. but you never get that uh, second chance of the first impression. That's right, always, that's right. That's always the thing. So, well, so handle, and, and, and there are ways to ask. You can handle yourself professionally and ask, but don't just go, hey, can I come on your podcast on an Instagram message? You know? Right, right. That's not the best way. Well, and you know, it's funny because even with me asking you to be on this podcast, I went through Gerald because Absolutely. I knew that you and Gerald were friends. And I was like, I don't want to reach out to this guy. He might be like, first of all, he might be like, who are you? I have never heard of you uh, or I don't remember you. And then, you know, I I was like, I don't want to be so presumptuous that I would think that, you know, he would, because I know it's an imposition to ask someone to take an hour out of their day and do this. Well, it's, that, that's hard. And for me with podcasts, I get asked to do, do some that I actually do turn down. And the only reason I do is because I spend, like you, like you said, I spend an hour a week talking about my own life, talking about pocket. So I feel like I really don't have a lot to add, to, to <laughs> so, so, so to speak. But with you, you sent me, you, you know, you're like, Hey, this is kind of what I want to talk about. I'm like, I love that. That's fresh. That's a, that's a different take on on what right. people know about me. So I appreciate you asking me. to. Be well, honest. and like I said, it's all, it all got, kind of goes back to storytelling, right? So when Absolutely. I approached you, I had an idea. I wasn't just saying, look, right. come, on the, come on the podcast and let's this, shoot the breeze for an hour. Absolutely. I had a specific idea of, of what we could talk about. And that's what people need to do when they, you know, when they are pitching someone else. But okay, so how, what's, what are a couple of things you can, a person can do to be a better podcast guest when they're, when they are asked? I would say you've got to be able to kind of deliver deliberate on what you're what you're talking about. You got to be able to, you know, I hate one word answers. You know, I we've all had those interviews where you get a guy, maybe you said something you didn't like, uh, and and he kind of backs in a corner and it's yes, no. You know, the one word answer is I can't as a host, I, I talk enough anyways, I cut mm-hmm. people off. I'm terrible about yeah. interrupting, I'm a terrible interviewer. But I, I feel like I do that more when guys aren't talking, Right. when the guests aren't talking. So I'd say, you know, come on knowing that you're going to have, that's why you're on there. It's not a, you're not showing somebody how to, how to cast, you know, the fish or how to pitch a jig under a boat dock. You're yeah. coming on to talk about your life. Be, be ready to tell, tell your story. You know, yeah. you've got that hour. And for most of these podcasts out there, you're getting an opportunity to talk in front of a most likely new audience for you. Yeah. And that yeah. that's a big deal is come on and and be yourself, be comfortable, but be able to answer everything that's thrown your way. I think that's huge. And, and honestly, answer. transparency is huge too. Well, and answer in a complete sentence. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> I, I can tell you a, a prime example of a guy that I've known for a very long time. This was an interesting podcast. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief with this, but I had Jesse Wiggins. He used to fish the Elite Series. Jesse's great, great, great mm-hmm. young man, but he ended up, he, he made the move to the Bass Pro Tour, and I had a I had a podcast where I was talking about some things going on with Major League Fishing, and he actually commented and said, uh, being funny, and said, well, if you'd like to hear from one of the bottom dwellers on the BPT, you should have me on sometime, <laughs> but that got my attention, right? Yeah. Jesse and I have each other's cell phone number. We text, joke, cut up a lot, so I know Jesse. He's really good friends with Gerald. Great guy. Unbelievable fisherman, mm-hmm. so I had Jesse on. And, and he is my number one example to people. He came on my show for 45 minutes and, and the comments were littered with, you gained a new fan, you gained a new uh. fan. People that really didn't know, because Jesse's kind of, he's quiet for the most part on social media, really, really personal guy, really charismatic, really funny, but he just likes to catch facts. Mm-hmm. He's not going to be like me doing however many YouTube videos. It's just not Jesse's style. He gained more fans for coming on and simply being honest and telling his story. I so I that. use him as an, that episode is one of my favorite episodes I've ever done. And it was really for me to be completely, it was kind of unexpected. Right. Because I know Jesse and I knew his story. He told it. It was so great. And the comments were, and he, and he, t- he texted me like, man, thank you so much for having me on because, you know, the, the his followers increased on, on social media and things from it. So just, just, 
be you, but but tell your story and definitely form complete sentences. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wrote, I just made a note. I will go find that episode and link to it in the show notes, Absolutely. so people Thank can you. go back and watch Absolutely. it. And it I and I'll go back and watch it. So is that his a, fishing story is how he got you know from. From absolutely not, because my favorite thing that people say, oh, you got to have a million dollars to be a pro bass fisherman. And Jesse will say, I didn't have anything. Yeah. And he qualified for the Elite Series twice before he ever even went because he couldn't afford it. Yeah. And then and then he won an event and that kickstarted him. He chose his profession outside of fishing to pay for it. He could work three days a week. Wow. And fish the rest of the time just to pay his bill. Incredible story. Oh, yeah. And I would definitely go back I, and listen It's worth a listen. So I really yeah. appreciate that. You know, another question I wanted to ask you is, you know, a, a lot of, we talk a lot on this podcast about building your audience and, and telling your story. It seems like every week we talk about be yourself and tell your real story. And that does help you build an audience. Um, but when, when you started trying to build your audience as a podcast host, was there anything about that, that process that surprised you that you weren't expecting or, or did everything kind of go like you thought it would? <laughs> no, no, my, my podcast ride has kind of been wild. Um, and, and kind of crazy um, at the same time. So Low Budget Live started as an Instagram only show. Oh, you're kidding. That, that's how it started. Three years ago. It was it, August. Right now is three years ago. We started the Sportswood Cup. And I had this idea with, with my buddies, Darian and Corey. And I said, man, what if you could do a professional looking podcast, so to speak, but use Instagram's live platform. It's mm-hmm. free. You're like cheap. Yeah. I'm a cheapskate. So yeah. I'm like, I've got music equipment and we found a way to run a mixer with microphones into a cell phone. We found a little plug in for 50 bucks and we were able to broadcast on Instagram for hours at a time. Oh my God. That's gosh. how it started. We were back. FLW let us backstage at the Horsewood Cup. <laughs> The first year, we made all the media mad. And I remember a guy from a unknown, an unnamed website saying, you guys need to get out of the media room. He knew me very well. He said, you guys need to get out of the media room because we had all the guys coming off stage. They were walking through the media and coming to me because they knew me. Sitting out <laughs> the microphone, we're streaming it on Instagram, coming right off the way in stage. And he says, you guys need to get out of the media room. You're not media. And I said, well, buddy, <laughs> let me tell you, you better hope I don't ever start to become media. Just as a joke, but like... They were, they were giving us all the love and they were getting really upset. And I understood that. They had a job to do. But the problem with Instagram was the podcast went away after 24 hours. Oh, right. Stupid. We were doing all this work. Right. And, and microphones. So we did that for a year. Oh, my God. I had Roland Martin, Jimmy Houston, and Bill Dance all in a corner booth in Missouri at a restaurant on live for two hours one night. No record of it. Oh I, my God. I've, I've got so many, but we just, we didn't care. We didn't care. But uh, actually, Brian Stockel from iCloud, he's the producer, Brian the Cart. Love Brian. Brian the Cart. Yep. Love him. Brian, Brian reached out to me and he's like, dude, I love what you're doing. But he's like, you got to record these for iTunes. He's like, you're just, you get, you've got great content, but you're wasting your time. Like, yeah. why are you doing this? Okay, I'm going to interrupt Luke right here because much like what happened with Gerald and Leanne Swindle a few weeks ago, there's just too much good stuff here. And I don't want to cut something out to make this shorter. So I'm going to break it into two parts. The story Luke is telling is really good. So come back next week to hear the end of it and more from Luke Duncan. Next week, we'll get some really good insight from Luke on how he got his first sponsor on the podcast, how letting people see your vulnerable side helps you grow and why he's like the Donald Trump of bass fishing. But for now, I'm going to close things out for the week. Please give me some love on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Give me that little thumbs up, but even better, leave a comment. That always makes me so excited when I get that little notification that someone's left me a comment. Down in the show notes, you'll see how to get a hold of me or Luke, and I'm sure he'd be just as tickled to hear from you as I would. I'll go for now, but I'll leave you with this. Just like Jerry McKinnis used to always say at the end of his television show, The Fishing Hole, this is dedicated to dad because he always had time to take me fishing. See you next time, y'all.